Hello, I'm journalist and comedian James Mullinger. Seven years ago, I left London, England and moved to St. John, New Brunswick. Since then, my stand-up career has taken me to just about every town and city in Atlantic Canada, which, let's face it, has provided plenty of material. But I've also come to realise that this place is special and, crucially, underappreciated. So my wife Pam and I started a magazine, The Maritime Edit, to celebrate its natural beauty and the incredible spirit of the people here. Last year, here on Atlantic Edition, I embarked on a tour to meet some of Atlantic Canada's most interesting and dynamic people and chatted about what drives and inspires them and learned what they love so much about this place we're all so proud to call home. And now we're doing it again. I'm back on the road to meet even more fascinating Atlantic Canadians and today I'm headed to meet a bona fide photographic genius, Freeman Patterson, at his home in Champers Bluff, New Brunswick. As one of the most well-respected photographers in Canadian history, Freeman has travelled throughout the world, capturing beautiful shots of nature along the way. Throughout his long career as both a photographer and writer, he's received many accolades, including memberships to the Order of Canada and the Order of New Brunswick. Now at the age of 88, he continues to share his passion for photography through extensive teaching and has donated his extraordinary piece of land to the Nature Conservancy of Canada to ensure its preservation. I'm meeting with Freeman on this very special land to learn about his life, inspiration and creative work. I'm James Mullinger and this is Atlantic Edition. I am on a delightfully bumpy and classically windy Kingston Peninsula Road, headed to Freeman Patterson's uniquely stunning home and property. It's fascinating to me how a boy that grew up on a farm in rural New Brunswick became one of the world's most prolific and indeed respected photographers. And he's still incredibly active now in his 80s. He, rises every morning and shoots for a few hours before breakfast and right now his garden's in full bloom. He's had an incredible career, a near-death experience and knows more about nature than anyone I've ever met. We could all learn a lot from Freeman Patterson and I can't wait to get stuck in. Here we go. I'm well. Did you oh, come to see to me see. or did you come to see the flowers? Uh, I came to see both. I love you both just as much. <laughs> it's so great to see you. Good to see you. Oh my goodness, it is so stunning here. I love everything about this place, as I know you do. I do, especially right now. I right? mean, it's, oh, it's always knocking. This is famously the, the best time here. Well, so yeah, time. you never know what time. This year it's early, but June is the peak of the rhododendron and the azaleas. And I have here 1,700 plants and spread over three acres. So it's, I think, arguably, it's the largest garden in the country devoted primarily to rhododendrons and azaleas. Wow. Well, I can't so, wait to see everything. About. I would love that. I want, I want to see inside. I want to see inside your brain up this way. Sure. Beautiful. You lead where you want to go. Oh, I'll thank follow. you. Well, that's a, that's a lovely gift to offer a guest. <laughs> This is stunning. This is the ultimate artist's space, isn't it? Well, I, there's a lot of art in here. There a lot is. From, from a lot of friends and from New Brunswick visual artists. 
How was this built? Who built it? 48, 49 years ago, when I did not have two cents to rub together, wanted a house and a place to teach. A friend and I, we scrounged, and we tore down three barns, and we got, found all the bricks, right. old bricks, cut spruce cedar logs off the property, and uh, we built the house. So everything is repurposed? You, you got all... Nearly everything here is repurposed. And so where did this come from? Oh, the, this uh, is actually an altar rail. And from there was a Catholic church down near Musquash, New Brunswick. It had been desanctified. Right. And it was being torn down, so. Because that's your, that's your workspace. My office, sort of, up there. Right. So My computer and so on. And you see the big window up there? Yeah. I've made more photographs from there all times of year than a few. Yeah. So that's the that's the golden spot right there. Well, pretty golden. Yeah. Because I live alone, I have <clears throat> I graze. I have no set meal times, and I can also graze to sleep. I will sleep a minimum of twice a day. Right. Like I'll sleep at night and I'll sleep one to two hours in the afternoon. If I feel like it, I'll sleep three times during the day. That's a that's a big day. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love everything about what I'm seeing. Oh, wow. This, this is one of my favorite books of yours. Um, I know it came out in, in 2013, but would you consider this a, a, a greatest hits? Well, not in terms of sales. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's probably my own favorite book. Right. But well, that's uh, all that matters in life. It really. does, really. Yeah. It was a companion to the exhibition that I did at the Beaverbrook Gallery. Right. And yeah. so it was a collection of work from, I know, from 1966 to, to 2013. That's that correct. must have been a hell of an editing job. Woo, was it ever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we spent a lot of time on that one. I'm sure. And I mean, I mean, when you look through a book like this, do you, do you feel like, is there, a, is there a favorite? Is that, is that like, it must be an impossible yeah. thing to do, but... There, there are a lot of favorites. I mean, because it's from all around the world. Yeah. I've spent a lot of time, for example, in Australia and New Zealand, a lot of time here mostly in South Africa, 45 trips over there to teach and so on, Israel and so on. In fabric greenhouses in Israel on the floor of the air of the desert, it's so hot they mm. can't have glass greenhouses so they cover them with these fabric or they uncover them. Wow. It's stunning. So I mean I mean what is it you think about your eye that when you step into an industrial space like this and you see that that you find that beauty in that moment? Well I think it's essential I, I, one of the things I learned quite early on, you abstract, you don't look at the labels. Mm -hmm. And here, for example, I look at the scene and I, immediately I divide it into one, two, three rectangles. Right. And so that simplifies it from a horizontal standpoint. See, there's, it's so busy in detail, mm -hmm. but notice there's a line across there and there's a line across here. So it's also three rectangles in this direction. Right, right, that's incredible. Then it's easy. I can increase the size of the upper rectangle by tilting the camera up. I can decrease or increase the bottom one by tilting it down. Same thing. Wow. With the cover. Mm. It's called, we all agree in the title, Embracing Creation. But what, does that, what does that mean? What does Embracing Creation Well, I do a lot of work with creativity. It's one of the things I talk about. One of the things I emphasize is that the creativity always is in the person, it's never in the tools. No camera made a, a great picture. The person using the camera may or may not have made a great picture. Cameras don't take pictures, people take Absolutely. pictures. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. And not take them, make them. Make them, make them. Yeah. it that, uh, that a view like this has managed to stay so unspoiled? This used to be a farm owned by a couple of gentlemen from Rossi. And when I left for university, I said to my father, if land ever becomes available here on the bluff, I'd like to buy it. Right. So somewhere in university, which I was paying every cent by myself, my father wrote and he said, there's tippus for sale. I don't know how I raised the money, but I did. <laughs> anyway, I bought it. Wow. When did you first realize you had a passion for photography? And, and, and did that kind of emanate from growing up in, in a place like New Brunswick where you're surrounded with beauty? Well, I mean, 
I grew up on a farm here. My sister's eight, four years younger than I. And I was the only child in my, of my age uh, in the community. It was a very rural. So you were the only person in your year? In school. my year. I went to a one-room school, and for seven of the eight years in the one-room school, I stood simultaneously at the bottom and the top of my class. My best friends on the, on the farm were things like the, the river and the beach and the rocks and the ferns and the lupins. I was very, very visually oriented. At what age do you think that it was that you started to realize that this, this thing, this beautiful surroundings, was something that you wanted to, to well, capture? Well, in my third year of university, I, I won a scholarship to spend the summer in Europe, and I took a camera with me. Now, the camera malfunctioned. I didn't get a single picture, but I didn't know that till I came home, and I had been totally bitten at that point by the bug. And I, I realized I have a medium that I just relax into, I can work with. And again, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's something which you can do, which is by its very nature, creatively solitary, but ultimately ends up being shared with Absolutely. hundreds and millions of people around the world. Yeah, I think it's vital for a person working in any artistic medium that they create for themselves first. I mean, obviously, I've done a lot of commercial assignments for corporations, design agencies, and so on. They've helped me hone my craft. Yes. But someone else is calling the shots. Right. Something grabbed me about those greenhouses that hadn't grabbed me before. And between workshops, I was photographing them at dawn, I was photographing them at the middle of the day, I was photographing them at sunset, and I couldn't get enough. And in the process of that edit, the symbol began to emerge. In the end, with 10 photographs, I found that I had told, and I can tell, I can show the 10 photographs, I use it in workshops. It tells a story of my illness, which led nearly to my death, long illness leading up to my near death in late 1999. Had a transplant, transplant failed. I was on life support, and but I jumped to the head of the list in all of Canada. Five days later, a second liver was available. And after much debate, they gave it to me and uh, even though that I had less than 1% chance of surviving. Wow. Did you, did you think you were going to die at that point? I didn't even know anything about it. Right. I'm out of it. I'm, I was in a coma. They kept me in a coma until early March, and then I woke up. How long were you in a coma for? Six weeks. Wow. And that time, you lose every muscle in your body. When I was allowed to wake up, I couldn't hold a pencil. How many years ago was this now? 21 years. The big thing that changed for me was, to use a, an evangelical Christian term, I realized I'd been born again. And, and I had an opportunity of life that I never dreamed I'd have, really. I mean, I hoped, I guess, but I just didn't. And I had always wanted a wonderful garden as a child, a flower garden, but I was never had it. My controlling father just didn't want me to have that. He wanted me to weed the potatoes and the beets and the turnips and all that kind of stuff which I did. So I realized, to put it in simple language, that even though I, I was 62 at the time of the transplant, one is never too old to have a happy childhood, and by damn, I'm now going to have a happy childhood. So this is what I've been doing. And so now, when you walk through that, and you, and you smell it, and you see it, and, and the colors just kind of pop in your eyes, yeah. Uh, do you feel that, that new lease of life? Do you, do, do you feel the most alive you've ever felt? Sure, mm. yeah. And, and um, you know, there are more, I have more creaky joints, of course. And, and I have to learn not to slope and hold, pull my belly button in and things like that. And I feel better the minute I do it. Ta-da! You know? <laughs> yeah.
Yeah. Taking it back to the start of your career, and once you realised that this was something that you loved to do, to, to capture all of this and, and capture the world, at what point did you realise that it was something that you could actually make a, a career out of, or indeed, you know, something that was actually going to be financially beneficial as well as kind well, of mentally beneficial? In 1962, I was hired by Alberta College in Edmonton. And after a couple of years of teaching, I said, I'm gonna give it a go. So at the end of my third year, I, with 500 bucks, and the Volkswagen Beetle, and two cameras and two lenses, I said, I, I mean, it's ridiculous. <laughs> Here I am, I'm still going. And nobody ever told me, do something sensible. Right. Where are the, the best places to photograph? And where, where do you feel most inspired? The best place in the entire world is wherever I am. Right. That's where I have to be present. That's where I'm going to see. Now that I am, shall we say, in my dotage, <laughs> first of all, I want to say that being old is the biggest good surprise I've ever had. Mm -hmm. It is by far the happiest, richest time of my life. I never expected, I always thought, once you got to 65, it was rheumatism and rocking chairs, and that was about it. Mm -hmm. It's hard to explain, but there is a sweetness and a richness. You let go of so much crap. Right. I mean, you've, you've done it all, but any of it you wish you hadn't done? No, but I had one other th thing of, well, there's three things in which I am enormously happy. Number one was the gift of the, the Nature Conservancy. Number two was the creation of this garden. But nothing, and in the end, this was a gift to me, and I didn't realize it. About 12 years before she died, I realized she was home alone one day. And I went down and I said, Mom, I'd like to talk to you. We sat down, I said, I want to tell you that of all the people I've ever met, you are my role model and you're the fairest person I've ever met. And I told her a few other things. And then she had a chance to say to me things, regrets that she had. It was a moment of just wonderful sharing between a mother and her son. I was with her when she died. And it's just like a steel door comes down. One minute she's there, the next minute she's not there. And then my second, and there was this incredible sense, I can never, everything we've ever said has been said. Everything we can ever do has been done. And then I realized, but you don't have anything more to say to her. You told her. And that, see, that's why it was a gift to me. I mean, I, so I had when she died, a, I went to her memorial service and I was in, the whole time I was in my truck and I just drive her and I said, Mommy, you did it. I mean, she, in the end, she became her own person. She came out of under my dad's control. Mm. And I was so proud of her. Yeah. She died free. She died free. Mm. That's beautiful. What would you say to people who are in familial environments where they haven't opened up and, and said what they want to say to someone? Sometimes it's very hard, mm. but it's well worth it. I, it's really, really well worth it. I, I find it fascinating that that is the one area of life that is never really explored in media or art or literature, and that is what you've just described, which is people coming into their own in the later stages of life. Right. Um, why do you think there is such an absurd kind of, A, obsession with youth, but also the obsession with youth also by default implies that, that life ends at, 50, 60, 70, why People worry about turning 40, for God's sake. Right. And then some, there is the old saying, life begins at 40, and there's so much truth in that. When I turned 80, I'm now 80, nearly 84, the best years of my life have been since I turned 80. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I can't, I mean, again, my best, best four years of my life have been my 40s, and yeah. I can't wait for the next. <laughs> well, if I've got a few left, I'll be lucky. But... <laughs> <laughs> well, with all your energy, I think. It's got a long way to dribble down. <laughs> <laughs> I might have used it all up. I might have used up all the energy.
I mean, this is obviously your, your happy place, but tell me how all of this came to be here and, and why everything is where it is, because I'm sure there's a, a method to this. Well, when I made the arrangement with the Nature Conservancy, I was allowed 500 feet from the center of my house in every direction right. where I could interact with nature. Cut firewood, plant gardens, and this is where I fulfilled that childhood dream. This is it. A gardener is always gardening in his or her imagination. They can imagine what it was like. We were imagining this. Right. That's what keeps us going. Right. A lot of people might just come in here and they say, oh, this is beautiful, and they go in like this, and they, they do a close-up of this one, and then they do a close-up of that one. And when they go back to show their friends, all they have pictures of flowers. Right. The friends have no idea where they were. Right. So how does one capture all of this beauty? Because it's so much. How do well, you do I, I don't, I, I don't do many close-ups. I mean, I do some, mm. but I'm using wide-angle lenses. I'm sometimes standing back and shooting, you know, telescoping, piling things up. This rhododendron, that rhododendron, that rhododendron, but it gives a sense of, wow, you know, mm. there's a reach to this. Yeah. It goes on. So I want to give a sense of place just as much as showing a particular blossom. How do you describe yourself to people? If someone, if you meet someone and, and, and they're not familiar with what you do and they ask what you do for a living, what, how do you answer? Well, I usually say, <laughs> I don't know. I, <laughs> I have to give up biographies now that I usually put photographer, writer, teacher, gardener. Right. Just, just, in that order. Well, something like that. Or it could be reversed. <laughs> to me, gardening is as much an art form as anything else. Right. Right. And it's recognized, for example, in some parts of the world as that. I mean, think of the Greek gardens of England, of France. Yeah. And of course, I mean, this garden was a gift from you to you, but it's also it is. your gift to the world. So when you donated some of the land to the Nature Conservancy of Canada, what was the thought process behind that? And, and what is your work? Well, the, the dona that donation was based on the fact that this, the birds that we hear singing, these birch trees, all of these things, it's their home. It's not a human home, first of all. It belongs to all of the, bot the botanical and zoological creatures. It's their home first. We're the guests. And, and so we don't think that way normally. And so we get them out of the way so we can move in. So. I wanted a place, first of all, not where future generations of people, but future generations of birch trees and, and ferns and raccoons and so on could live happily. The Nature Conservancy allowed me to interact freely with nature. And so this is a very personal thing I've given to myself, first of all. But it gives me great joy when people like you and others come Look, before there was a, a Bible, before there was a Quran, the only scriptures we had were nature. Our forebears used nature as their guide, not for morality and everything else. They observed it and they followed it. They were in touch. We have moved ourselves away. We think we know better. Sure. And it's the ego of our species that may do us in. Amen to that, my friend. Thank you so much <laughs> for you. this beautiful day. Thank you. Thank you.